open ocean, where all the species that walked the earth began their evolution. Some of the first to come ashore were the reptiles, like sea snakes, turtles, and the biggest of them all, the deadly saltwater crocodile, Woo! an apex predator. And their smaller cousins, the ocean-going lizards, like the marine iguanas of the Galapagos Islands. In this adventure, we go into the fascinating world of these reptiles of the deep and study them in their home environment as they swim, graze, and hunt like their ancient oceanic ancestors millions of years ago. We're heading to far north Queensland to study saltwater crocodiles in the open waters of the South Pacific. You'll find saltwater crocs right around Australia's tropical north. We'll be tracking them in the great untouched wilderness of Cape York Peninsula, where we've arranged a rendezvous with pilot Dennis Wallace. Yeah, not bad, mate. Uh, good not to bad see at again. all. Yeah. Yeah. Like so what do you reckon? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm, I'm in there. Right, jump in and let's go and right, find okay. you some crocs, mate. Good stuff. How are you, Perry? Howdy, Brazaka. This guy's one of the great characters of the North. Everyone calls him Brazaka. Don't ask me why, it's just Brazaka. You haven't got any better looking, mate? No, mate, I'll tell you what. I'm not, I'm not aging well at all. <laughs> This is the only way to cover a lot of ground up here. The whole area is totally isolated, and even a four-wheel drive wouldn't get through. We're searching for big saltwater crocs near the estuaries where tropical rivers join the Coral Sea. It's always been a dream of mine to swim with crocs in the open ocean and study their behavior in an unbounded environment. And it's a big one. It's a big salty, all right. He's heading out offshore. Looking for fish, crustaceans, maybe even turtles. Woo, he spotted us. And the power that he derives from that tail tucks his legs right back in and he's heading back towards the mangroves where he can hit the camouflage of the deep, dirty water. Here we go. Check this out for a crocodile track. This area is home to the largest crocodiles in the world. They look big from above. When you get on the ground level, you can get an idea of the enormity of the animal. Ooh, I've seen a few slides, a few big slides. Myself and Dad up in the Gulf, Cape York Peninsula, but I tell you what, this one takes the cake. This is absolutely massive. So when they walk, they tuck their legs in alongside their belly, so his belly reaches out right out here. That is one big crocodile. And he's hauled himself out of the water, come up this sandbar, straight up into the creek, and heading right out towards the ocean. This is huge, absolutely mammoth. Have a look at this. You can see his tail swooshing one side to the other. You can see the dirt where his back legs... Look how big those feet are. His back feet are sunk in there and push the dirt out to the back. That's how come I know he's gone this way. And it's fresh. Really fresh. He's just in front of us somewhere. Imagine if he was out in the ocean when we get out there. Big slide. This was probably the biggest crocodile slide I've ever seen. Saltwater crocodiles are the largest reptile on the earth. They can grow over 18 feet. And I guess that's about all I could say. 18 foot plus. Terry's gonna bring the dinghy back around so as we can get out into the ocean and have a scout around. You can see these coastal lagoons. There's a thin peninsula of sand. And the crocs actually traverse to and fro there. Great place.
place for an ambush, and they've got great cover out the ocean and in the lagoon. And here's another monster. Another 16-foot-plus crocodile. This is certainly legendary crocodile territory. And he's out in the ocean looking for a feed. There's plenty of food for ocean-going crocodiles. And if we're going to share space with them, we'll need to be very accurate and careful about where and what we do. out of the mangroves. He's watching us, he's staring right at us. And this is the art of the crocodile. They'll sit and wait, ambush predators, probably crawled over here early this morning, and at night, anything crosses this beach, whack, big hit. animal impressive there's his tail mark where he heads straight back over to the ocean look across here it seems so strange to see a croc on the beach like this but remember this is an isolated area with no people for hundreds of miles and that makes the crocodile behave differently to when he lives close to human populations which are a threat He had a bit of a thrash, and now he's off. Look at him go, straight out through the breakers. Terry's brought the dinghy round, and with the chopper spotting for us, we've got a great chance of catching up to the crocodile. And I'm one step closer to doing something I've always wanted to do. Share space with a crocodile, underwater, one-on-one. -on -one. Here's my chance. She's coming up. Here it is. Yes, it's a female. It's an adult female. She'd be around about 10 feet. Cruise in, cruise in. She's onto us. She's diving down to the bottom to try and seek camouflage on the bottom. Here's my chance. Woo! It's about a 10 footer, maybe a little more. And she's not worried, she's just cruising along. Look at the way she's using her feet, just plodding along the bottom. It's like a dinosaur. It's just like being with a dinosaur underwater. She's using a transparent eyelid. She's got like goggles on. They can see through that protective eyelid. I'm getting in close, really close. She's not worried. She's very calm. Here she goes. She's up for a breath. Look at her little arms tucked in. Uh-oh, you see her opening up her mouth. That's a sign, that's a demonstration. These are my teeth, stay back or I will bite you. I'm gonna have to keep my distance. That's a body posture, she's warning me. Beautiful animal. She's heading slowly towards the river mouth. Using her tail, that big, powerful, rudder-like tail, those web back feet, and they will just plod along. Wow, one on one. One on one with a dinosaur. Oh, she's opening her mouth up. She's showing me her teeth. But I've got Terry right there, keeping an eye on her. It's important that Terry keeps very vigilant and looks for any signs that she's going to have a go. But she's quiet. She's really quiet. In fact, she doesn't feel threatened by my presence at all. She feels that she's in command. Under she goes. She's got a breath. She's going to go back down to the bottom. This is amazing. She could just one flick of her tail and be 30 metres away from me just in the flash so quick that I wouldn't be able to get anywhere near her. She's using the dark, deep water and the rocks and the seaweed to blend, to camouflage. Oh, here we go. That's a threat. She's, she's focused straight back on me. Mouth ajar, teeth. And that's a back off or I could bite. Look at her. See how she's got her eyes open? That's a transparent eyelid. She can stay under the water for nearly an hour. She's happy enough that she's kept me at bay. She's going for air. Woohoo! I can't believe this. She is not showing any signs of aggression whatsoever. 
She understands the power she's got. I'm no threat to her. She is in command. And I'm in her territory. She's heading back down towards the bottom, back into the weed. Oh, she's turned. Oh, strike. That was the ultimate warning. Now she's back, Archie. She's showing me how big her back is, and that's a threat. She could have bit me. She could have chopped down on me. No worries at all. But she decided... Oh! That was too close. Straight over my goggles. I'll have to get out. She rules. This is the perfect opportunity to investigate the beaches and the mangroves. We saw plenty of crocs around here from the air, and we're hoping to catch up with them at ground level. Here's where the beach meets the mangroves. This is a really hot spot for all species of wildlife, particularly crocodiles. It's like a halfway zone from the ocean into the estuaries. You can see all this young mangrove growth behind me. When the tide comes in, it's a haven for crocodiles just to sit in there and snap at all the fish. A huge number of fish and crustaceans spend the early parts of their lives in the twisted tangle of roots. There is so much prey of every size that mangroves make the perfect home for baby and juvenile crocodiles. Mangroves are some of the most productive plant colonies on Earth. They generate an enormous number of life forms, and many of them, even hermit crabs, are a daily part of the diet for saltwater crocodiles. These tropical mangroves are full of crocs, but when we approach, their first instinct is to disappear. Unlike the open ocean, this is their home territory, and that makes it almost impossible to get close in a powerboat. Sui's been in plenty of croc territory before, and she's on the lookout too. The sound of the outboard tells the crocodiles we're coming. And by the time we get there, they're gone. And there's only a slide to tell us where they've been and what they've been doing. This one's gone up over the bank, probably into an inland sunning position. So I'm going to sneak through the mangroves, through the foliage, and see if I can observe. And there he is. It's a real beauty. That mouth gaping is part of how they regulate their body temperature. They cool their brain by letting moisture evaporate from the mouth while warming the rest of their body in the heat of the sun. Like dogs pant, elephants flap their ears, crocodiles open their mouths to thermoregulate. They've got an awesome tooth structure, huge, great penetrating teeth, just like my fingers designed to grab, hold and kill large food sources like big mammals. And check out those teeth. Crocodile's bite is awesome. One of the most powerful forces in the animal kingdom. They sink those teeth deep into their prey and then head shake, literally tearing it apart. And the jaw pressure, incredible, 3,000 pounds per square inch back in the jaws. At the tooth tips, whew, It'd be mind-blowing how much pressure they'd have. Have a look at this. He's starting to materialise. Snout, eyes, ears. One of the preferred hunting techniques is the strike. He's lining up. How's this? He's got a bird. Oh, he's going into a bag. He's threatening other crocodiles. They take in a big breath of air and puff themselves up, exposing their back and all those big armour plates along their back. And they're showing, look how big I am, look how big I am. Check out the size of my back. And that's very intimidating. It's a threatening posture to other crocodiles or anything that they don't want in their territory. 
When we see one of these giant reptiles emerge from the murky waters, we're looking at just how it was more than 200 million years ago. Their crocodilian ancestors had almost exactly the same shape, the same sort of armored skin, and you can easily believe the evidence they used to eat dinosaurs for breakfast. Small ones, but dinosaurs just the same. And if anything attacked them, they had to be mighty powerful just to break through the skin. Like all reptiles, the saltwater crocodile is an egg layer. And like sea turtles, they go into a trance during the laying process. This female's finally starting to deposit her eggs. Once she's laid a few eggs, it's then that we'll be safe enough that we can move in a little closer. Because then she won't even be aware of our presence. saltwater crocodile goes into this trance-like state. Her whole entire reason for existing is to reproduce and lay these eggs. She's not even aware of our lights or our presence and won't be disturbed until she's done this all-important job of propagating her species. The nesting goes on for hours, and she can lay up to 70 eggs at a time in a spot she's chosen to stay dry through the wet season. If they're submerged, the embryos will die in the shell. At the end of the laying, she moves those massive legs in an incredibly delicate way to cover the eggs with vegetation. The heat given out by the rotting vegetation incubates the eggs until it's time to hatch 90 days later. It's amazing how such a big creature can be so gentle. Once she's finished covering the eggs, her very next job will be defense. She will defend her nest, her nest site, with her life. And she'll fight anything that goes near her eggs. She's beautiful. She's just a mummy dinosaur defending her babies. This is the best time of day for crocodiles. They're basking out on the banks just before they lose the afternoon sun. So if we've got any chance of seeing slides or signs of crocodiles, now's the time. And when the sun finally sets, we find it even easier to get up close to them. The same crocodile that will slide away and hide invisibly in daylight will just sit there at night while we can cruise in to observe them at close quarters. This cute little blighter is not far past the hatchling stage. Its survival instincts are already well developed and it's out hunting food wherever it can find it. Baby crocodiles are real little battlers. From the moment they emerge from the egg, they're looking for prey. And if you get close enough, they won't hesitate to sink their tiny little teeth right into your finger. The crocodiles are easier to sneak up on at night. They use the cloak of darkness for their camouflage. And with the spotlight, I can pick up their eye shine and see them. They don't realize that I'm onto them. Spotlighting's a great way to check the health of crocodile populations. And in this stretch of mangroves, everything looks great. There's plenty of babies and plenty of food for them to survive and thrive. Ooh, this one's a little bigger. 12, maybe 18 months of age. Eat good-sized prawns. They love to eat prawns. Sit in the shallows, whack, strike out at them. Decent-sized fish, take small rodents, little reptiles, frogs, love to eat amphibians if it gets up into the fresh water. At this juvenile stage of life, they have to be opportunistic. Baby crocs will take on anything that moves and that they can easily overpower. They have to, or they wouldn't survive. 
They can torpedo straight through the water, in between the mangroves and over the muddy banks. They use a combination of techniques to get their food. It's all instinct. No one taught this little blighter to snap at the surface, but it works. Have a look at this little guy. He's actually hunting insects, little bugs right at the surface of the water. Now, he's going to hunt anything that's smaller than he is that he can overpower easily, whether it's little crustaceans, bugs, spiders, anything he can get a hold of. Even these little fish are in danger. Just about everything is the micro version of the behavior you'll see in fully grown crocodiles, and it's all instinctive. Once they're established in the water, their mother leaves them to catch their own food. How's the way the little blighter waited in the shallows? Whack! Snapped out. This is perfect training for his ambush techniques because when he gets to be an adult, he's gonna be ambushing big prey sources like wild pigs, kangaroos and stuff. Have a look at this swimming style. He's just like his dad. Judging by the number we saw overnight, there must be dozens of baby and juvenile crocodiles in the area. Odds are, only one in every 200 will survive to reach the size of this big bloke. What a beauty! We continue our search in the mangroves and estuaries, looking in the big waters. It isn't long before we start spotting mature crocs. And from the air, we get a good overall picture of their entire habitat. Down there. Oh, and it's another beauty skimming through the murky water. Our survey confirms the adult population is healthy, but only here in the remotest part of Australia. The main reason they're holding their own in Cape York Peninsula is the lack of people pressure. Almost all of this vast area is a true wilderness and virtually inaccessible. As youngsters, they may have their enemies in the wild, but that's not going to threaten the species or even a local population. The biggest threat to the crocodile is conflict with humans and especially destruction of habitat. This bloke hates the chopper. He strikes and heads straight back into the mangroves. Steve spotted something that demonstrates the awesome power the saltwater crocodile really has. It's a very big croc, and it's been feeding on a fully mature sea turtle. Pigs. A herd of them foraging in the salty swamplands behind the beach. Crocs just love them. They're a real delicacy, one of their favorite foods. These aren't your average domestic porkers. They're wild and tough. They bite. They've got tusks, and they call the big guys razorbacks. It's kind of hard to see from the air, but that nice tuft of hair right up their back onto their neck is why they got their name, Razorbacks. And if Steve's real careful, maybe we'll get to see one up close. But don't count on it, because they really bite. Gee, Steve loves these pigs. Unfortunately, they are dangerous and one of the worst introduced pests in Australia. Gotcha. You're all right. Come on, man. You're all right. You're all right. You're all right. Have a look at this girl. Isn't she gorgeous? She's got a beautiful haircut. You can see why they get the name Razorback. And this is a fully grown sow. A lactating female. You're all right. You're all right, sweetheart. You're OK. You're OK. Isn't she beautiful? Absolutely gorgeous. You're all right. You're all right. And it's a lactating female. Don't bite me now. So you can see a little... Oh, you don't like me playing with those, do you? She's got some babies around here. Look at those hooves. Oh, gosh, I love pigs. I just love them. You're a good girl. Go on, then. Hey, hey, hey. Hey. Get out of it. Get out. Run. Hey. Now, no fighting. Quick, quick, quick.
She's a little bit funny, <laughs> a little bit grumpy. I think she wanted to bite me. We're heading inland to a freshwater swamp close to the coast, the perfect place for crocs to ambush pigs and other food sources like birds and snakes. And we spot some really big salties. Just because they're called saltwater crocodiles doesn't mean they don't like fresh water. They're perfectly at home in any water, as long as the climate's warm enough for breeding. They're found in most tropical regions. A big flock of magpie geese, a really plentiful food source for crocodiles. And then we spot one of the biggest crocs we've seen. He's in an area where there's nowhere to hide. He'd normally slide down deeper and conceal himself under the reeds, but he's just too big. Look at the size of him. Zaka takes us down a bit closer, and the croc decides he can warn us off with a good threat display. And if we do get close enough, he'll even try to take on the chopper. This is one croc that's best left well alone. Some of the biggest crocs I've ever seen. The mighty saltwater crocodile. The apex predator, king of Australia. But they're not the only marine reptile you can find in the Cape. Steve's taking advantage of the location to search for a water-going lizard that's getting very hard to find in the wild. This swamp is prime habitat for rusty monitors. It's actually a coastal lagoon. Although it's fresh water, right behind a sand dune is the ocean. Of course, the rusty monitor, they can be found out in the salt water. They can excrete salt through their nostrils. No worries at all. We've got to find the rusty monitors before it's too late. It's all a part of an endangered species breeding program that we've got going at Australia Zoo. Goanna Research, that's what we're into. And this species is declining. Here's a tree snake. Now, it's a harmless species, a frog eater. This is a good sign the reptiles are on the move. It's just a matter of locating them. They get right down inside the hollows. Really hard to spot. And all you'll see is a little bit of tail. Maybe their head just sitting out watching you. They know I'm coming a long way before I can see them. The other thing that I have to pay particular attention to in these swamps is crocodiles, the other saurian that shares their territory. And there's a frog mouth. It's an owl-like bird mimicking the branches. If I seem a little nervous, I am. This is about as close as you'd ever want to get. You can see him moving through the water. This one's big too. He's big. He's real big. And he's grumpy. I can't see well enough looking down. They're just pushing along through the water. Up here, Steve can keep a good lookout for crocs, and he'll be able to spot the right trees for finding the rusty monitors. This is the perfect habitat. Water for hunting and trees for nesting. Big ones. Big crocs. And now that I've got a bit of height, I can see them. Cruising along the bottom. Barely visible when you're down at the same level. Woo! These big saltwater crocodiles provide excellent protection for the smaller reptile species, the rusty monitor. In actual fact, the rusty monitor is one of the smaller goanna species. They don't even reach three feet in length. It's interesting how the smaller species is protected by the largest reptile on the face of the earth. She's got his tail sticking out of a knot. There it goes, it's just going in.
Unreal. This is a good score, really good score. It's very important that, um, that I don't upset any animal's environment, particularly one of the rarest goannas in the world. Certainly one of the most important in scientific research. I'm using a capture technique taught to myself and dad by some close Aboriginal friends of ours on the east coast of Cape York Peninsula. They utilise fronds from the grass tree to tickle little lizards out just like this. And they learnt that from their grandfathers who learnt from their grandfathers. It's a brilliant technique. There's no stress on the animal and no harm to the environment. Here we go. Got the tail nice and gentle, coaxing, coaxing. Here he comes. There he is, little lizard. There he is, little lizard. Look at him. What a little beauty. Well, there you go. This is the most significant lizard in Goanna research at the moment. Unbelievable. And I'd say it's a little girl one too. It's a little girl. Boy, isn't she cute. Look at her. Wow. All I had to do was just tickle, 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 until I got her tail and then tickle her from the head end. And out she came, nice and steady, without destroying the environment, without destroying that home tree. Because we're going to breed these, we're going to learn all about them, so as we can secure them, so as my kids, kids, kids can enjoy the rusty monitor out in the wild. And I'll be able to put them, her and her baby, straight back into this tree. It's what I would consider a home tree. Very significant, very important. If it rots away under natural causes, so be it. There's no way I want to disrupt one little piece of bark. Isn't she gorgeous? Absolutely gorgeous. Just one more cursory look for crocodiles. I've been up here a while. Now, the reason we're in this Malaluka or paperbark swamp is to find these. One of the smallest goanna species, one of the largest crocodile species, share the same habitat. Now, these animals are capable of living in completely saline conditions, right in the thickest mangroves. In fact, about 10 mile back that way, that's where they are found, in the mangroves. I believe that this rusty monitor is kind of a new species. And when I get it back home, we'll, uh, we'll get the museum people to have a look, and I reckon we'll discover that it's not actually a rusty, it's not actually a spotted tree, but a split between the two. Of course, the rusty monitor is one of the few lizards in the entire world that can handle completely salt water. They have the ability to excrete salt via their nose. Great technique. And they are spectacular. Good swimmers. You can see that tail enables them to swim just like a crocodile, above and below the water. And one of their favourite food sources is insects and crustaceans. You can see her little ears there, beautiful little nostril, and look at her eyes. Oh gosh, she's cute. And stick, they stick like Velcro. Really good at tree climbing. I wouldn't consider these rusty monitors to be a strict marine reptile. They live on the fringe, they're kind of halfway between. Of course, the marine iguanas of the Galapagos Islands, they spend all their time in the seas, in the ocean. But these guys are found out in the mangrove waters, which is right against the ocean where the ocean meets the land, all the way back into these beautiful freshwater swamps. From Northern Australia to the Galapagos Islands, home to the world's only ocean-dwelling lizard. A couple of the locals. The Galapagos Islands are 600 miles off Ecuador in the eastern Pacific Ocean, just south of the equator. Complete isolation on these rugged islands meant that a whole range of animals took a totally different path of evolution from their cousins on the mainland, among them the marine iguanas. Have a look at this. You can see how his tail now he's dragging his cloaca along. It's flattened out, it's a lot wider instead of that 
tail drag. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Life's pretty tough when you're a marine iguana. Out here on the Galapagos Islands, there's no danger. They have no fear. Once you get up over a metre, over three feet in length, nothing's going to worry you. Now, this bloke's a fully grown adult male. They can grow a little larger, up to around four feet. But isn't he a little beauty? Have a look at the prehistoric spikes he's got along his back and off his head. Beautiful specimen. This little marine iguana. He's on the side of this rock. Nice, warm, dark rocks, absorbing the heat. Even though it's cloudy, he's getting plenty of warmth. He'll get warm enough and then head out into the ocean for a feed. The seashore rock hopping in the constantly breaking waves is amazing. They stick to the most slippery rocks using their sharp claws. If I tried this, I'd just slip into the surf and get pounded on those rocks. They've adapted to this aquatic life perfectly. The marine iguanas are beautiful to watch as they climb straight up these rocks with ease. Watching him like this, it's easy to see how they're related to those dinosaurs who came out of the oceans so many millions of years ago. Watch this. This bloke is still as a rock. It's only the yellow coloration in his spines that I can pick him from those volcanic boulders. Look at that grip. I'm being washed around like a lump of seaweed and he just sits there like he's nailed to the rock until he decides it's time to move on. When they're doing some serious swimming, they move like crocodile. Their tail action is exactly the same. And the only way to appreciate it is to swim with them. Look at this. My boyhood dreams are coming true. I've always wanted to dive with marine iguanas. There's no such thing as exclusive feeding territories. They all share the same food sources. This is the perfect place to study their swimming style. Their technique is to tuck in their legs, flex their whole body from side to side, and propel themselves onto the rocks. You beauty! Diving's all about grazing. It's a kind of green algae called ulva, and they just love it, totally thrive on it. They grab, crunch, pull, grab, crunch, pull, and they push it down with their fleshy tongue, then back up to the surface for a breath. We've hit prime time. It's heated up, the heat of the day. Now they come down in amongst the boulders to feed. It's only the bigger lizards that can hold their temperature that can afford to come down into the depths. Time and time again they'll die until their temperature gets so low that they gotta go back up to bask. Like all reptiles, they don't have the internal ability to control their own body temperature. Slowly as they're grazing, they cool down to the water temperature. Mmm, looks pretty good. Yummo! A good bit of algae. <laughs> I wish I had claws that could grip to these rocks. I'm getting hammered by the tidal surges. Do 
you can see the skin starting to slough off its body, just like other reptiles. It just peels off the epidermal layer as they grow. This is a pretty good sized lizard too, by crikey. Look at him, feeding on the algae just like the dinosaurs used to do. And he doesn't care about me. He hasn't got a care in the world except feeding that hungry tummy. Beauty! These blokes can hold for as long as 20 minutes and dive as deep as 60 feet as they swallow their food aided by that fleshy tongue they take in water but they shoot it straight back out through their nostrils which is the way that they excrete salt fantastic to witness a reptile grazing on the bottom of the ocean i've always wanted to do this swim in the sea with crocodiles and then join the galapagos marine iguana for a long underwater lunch this has been a rare insight to the amazing underwater world of reptiles of the deep. And what a great experience to share the secrets of the Australian saltwater crocodile and the marine iguanas of the Galapagos. Woo!